Alive and Well STL is a presentation of the St. Louis Regional Health Commission and Rare Gem Productions to build a healthier St. Louis. Power up with the positive. Learn more at onerarejem.com. That's O-N-E-R-A-R-E-G-E-M.com. Support for Alive and Well STL comes from Beyond Housing. Helps entire communities become better places to live. Learn more at beyondhousing.org. The Regional Health Commission works in partnership with regional health sector advocates and stakeholders to improve health care access, reduce health disparities, and improve health outcomes for the uninsured and the underinsured in St. Louis City and County. Alive and Well, STL, with Bethany Johnson Javois, CEO of the St. Louis Integrated Health Network. Today we are joined by Robin Sanger, founding director of Peace for Tarpon, a trauma informed community movement in Tarpon Springs, Florida, and Marsha Morgan, chief operating officer of Truman Medical Center Behavioral Health and Cancer. Kansas City and partner of Trauma Matters KC. Everyone has a part to play in this and that everyone must play a part in this because this cannot be from the top down. It can't be mandated by the federal government or by the states or whatever. This has to be done in an individual person to person, heart to heart, soul to soul, community by community. This is how this work will be done to transform communities from the inside out. I'm really excited to be speaking with both who have been instrumental in transitioning to a trauma informed model and I would assert perhaps been transformational in starting a movement. We'll be right back. Robin, the first thing I want to ask you in terms of your introduction to our community is tell me about your definition of alive and well. Alive and well in my community. Growing up, I moved around a lot, so I never really had a sense of place or a sense of hometown or that type of thing. So with that as a starting point, Tarpon Springs is the first place I've ever really considered to be a hometown. So to be alive and well here in Tarpon Springs means not only to have a sense of safety and security and connectedness, but also to understand that as a community, we face common issues and together we can work towards common goals and common solutions. And understanding that we have the power and the privilege of doing that here in our community is what that means. Alive and well, STL. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I am Bethany Johnson Javois, CEO of the St. Louis Integrated Health Network and host of Alive and Well STL, sponsored by the St. Louis Regional Health Commission. Today, we are joined by Robin Sanger, founding director of Peace for Tarpon, a trauma informed community movement in Tarpon Springs, Florida, and Marsha Morgan, chief operating officer of Truman Medical Center Behavioral Health in Kansas City and partner of Trauma Matters KC, a trauma informed care model. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. As we talk and think about what it means for our community, particularly now in St. Louis, to be alive and well, I'm really excited to be speaking with both of you who have been instrumental in each of your communities in transitioning to a trauma-informed model. And I would assert, perhaps, that you have been transformational in starting a movement down there. So let's see what happens. So, Robin, I'm going to direct my first question to you. Can you give us your definition of a trauma-informed community? Literally, what would it look like? Well, a trauma-informed community would be a place where folks understand initially that there's reasons behind behaviors, things do not happen at random, and that they understand that most of the issues, if not all of the issues that we face as a community and in our lives are directly related to trauma and have that understanding that it's not about random acts of violence or it's not about you know, things just happening out of the blue for no reason, but there are reasons behind that, which directly those roads lead to trauma. I've experienced that, that they lead to trauma every time. And as a community, if we have that awareness and that understanding and all of our community assets have that awareness and understanding, we start to react and respond differently to situations in our lives and in our community. And I think that initial response is what we're going to see first. Of course, different systems are implementing specific programs to encourage this. As our 23,000 people, if they have the understanding that to create true community change, we have to recognize the true cause the root cause of what we're looking at and not address symptoms, but address the cause. Marsha, what is your definition of having an alive and well community there in Kansas City? Well, one of the things that in addition to the understanding that Robin talked about, 
The other thing that we've been working really, really hard on is recognizing secondary trauma and then building resilience. So the whole idea that everybody is involved, everybody has had some level of traumatic experience that colors their perspective, that rewires their brain at an individual level, um, those are important things. And then recognizing, and for me, a healthy community is related to, okay, so all of that's happened, but what are we going to do about it? And that's where we talk about building resilience and recognizing some of the factors that then go into becoming healthy, whether it's, you know, some of the simple things like, you know, taking walks, healthy eating, you know, um, decreasing use of tobacco, but other things that people may think are more on the, quote, fringe, including things like meditation and mindfulness and yoga. Those are all things that help us build resilience. The foundation for resilience is always family and supports, whether family is defined by the person. So people who are supportive, people who care about you, people who love you, those are all pieces of having a healthy community from my perspective. So, Marcia, can you tell us about Trauma Matters, KC, the work that you have seen and the changes you have seen in the care of patients since transitioning to a trauma-informed model? Trauma Matters, KC, was formed almost three years ago, and it was based on an overwhelming recognition from a children's behavioral health needs assessment. And that needs assessment included families, kids, pediatricians, teachers, school nurses, mental health professionals, and sort of the overarching issue that people wanted to see addressed was toxic stress and trauma. And so we started really just having monthly meetings, individuals, people representing organizations started coming together to meet. We've held a number of workshops, seminars, best practice. We've had one best practice training. We've got another one that's planning stage. We've also then provided and been working with the Missouri Department of Mental Health on a continuum of trauma responsiveness. So Missouri Department of Mental Health has developed what is trauma awareness, what is trauma sensitivity, what is trauma responsiveness, and then what is trauma-informed care. And we're working with organizations to assess where they are and then to take steps to become more trauma informed. And when you think about trauma, it's not about buying equipment and it's about investing in people's understanding of what happens to people and why they behave the way they do. So it's an investment in perspective, it's an investment in attitude. So Trauma Matters Now has probably more than 35 organizations, more than 125 people who are committed to informing their various networks about what trauma is and why trauma matters. And that's kind of how we came up with our name. That is, hmm. you know, there are matters about trauma and then trauma matters. Can you give an example to the listeners of how you and your work can begin to see changes, maybe in conversation, maybe in the way that people are constructing the conversation or specific behavior? that is beginning to change that you could share with us? Sure, I think so. We have one of the initiatives that we've had here in Kansas City is to work with our Kansas City, Missouri School District on creating trauma-sensitive schools. And when we started the trainings with pilot schools, we had a teacher who was very, very disengaged. She didn't feel connected to her colleagues. She felt like what she was doing was really just kind of babysitting and that because she's a specialty teacher and then as we went through the process and went through the training and she became very you know trauma informed began to understand that the kids behaviors that she was seeing wasn't that they were just doing bad things but it was a result of what was happening to them she changed her title and now she's the movement coordinator for the school and, mm -hmm. you know, she's got a completely different attitude about her kids and she feels like she's part of the team. We have crisis intervention team officers, police officers who are recognizing that they do have secondary trauma. They're setting up buddy sessions so that they 
develop ways to support each other and to listen to each other when they come into a horrific scene. So those are just a couple examples. But the conversations are interesting in that we now hear trauma in a number of venues. HR departments are starting to say in areas where we work, we need to start looking at what's going on with our employees so we can have better employees and we can have better productivity and better outcomes. So those conversations have started. I think Robin's probably further down the road than we are. We've used Tarpon Springs as a model. And Robin, how do you view your role and purpose of connectedness and community? Well, I've always seemed to be a connector of sorts, and that's a role that comes very naturally to me. Professionally, I'm an artist, so to me, this is a very creative process of how we can enhance relationships with each other, of how we can have a deeper understanding of behaviors within our community and the reasons behind those behaviors and how we can successfully work together to create a healthier uh, community in every way, physically, emotionally, mentally. And I think that by connecting each other, that's how that begins to happen. When we realize that we have so much in common, that we have, we're so much more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. So, As an artist, what additional gifts do you think that that lens brings to the table as you go about leading the work of building a trauma-informed community there in Tarpon Springs? Well, the work of becoming a trauma-informed and also a trauma-responsive community is a very long-term project. So you could really look at it as kind of when I do an art project where you know that something is possible, you know that someday it will exist, You may not see it at the moment, but you have the confidence and you have the wherewithal to know that things will fall into place as they need to, and eventually you can get to where your goal is. But the process itself is definitely not a straight line. It's not a, you know, here to there, because there are so many different facets. It's a very, very complex problem. But I wouldn't say problem, I would say challenge. But the confidence that we will get there whether it takes generations or whether, you know, however long it takes is, I think, at the basis of that. I'm comfortable not having an immediate solution, knowing that there are many, many steps to this creative process. Could you talk to us a bit about the facets or what is beginning to come together for your community in terms of building a trauma-responsive community? And within that answer, talk a bit about your definition of that based on the work that you're doing. Well, We consider every single person in our community part of the solution. Our motto is offer the peace, P-E-A-C-E dash P-I-E-C-E, you can. And we know that every single individual has a unique gift to offer to help bring about this trauma-informed, trauma-responsive community. So initially, I looked at it through a rather narrow lens, thinking that service providers and different agencies and the city itself would be kind of like the juice behind this. But as Peace for Tarpon grows, what's really becoming very evident is that people who work for agencies may be here today, they may be gone tomorrow. They're at the table because that's where their passion is, more than likely, but also because it's their job. So it's a little bit different take uh, if someone comes to the table because they are there because this is their community, this is what they're invested in, and they're coming with all of their heart to the table. So it's a little bit different energy, but I find that that is really what is required in creating a trauma-informed and trauma-responsive community is it's not about the big fish, if you will. It's about every single one of the individuals who live here who can recognize the causes and consequences of trauma in their own lives and the lives of their families and co-workers and have, first of all, that deeper understanding of what that means. And next, to be able to understand trauma is resolvable, that we as a community and as individuals can work together to create very effective change. So, Marcia, what is your hope for the future for Kansas City based on the work that you're doing today? What does the future look like there? Oh, my gosh. Well... My hope is that every business, every organization, every system recognizes the impact of trauma and that across the board, we start the conversations when we have 
things happening that we talk about what's happening to you that brought you to this place. And, you know, so our, that our city becomes healthier. We have a Chamber of Commerce initiative on Healthy KC. And, you know, when we take a look at obesity, we take a look at chronic diseases, we take a look at tobacco use. Because of the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, we can trace a lot of those issues back to childhood trauma. My dream two generations from now would be that we've eliminated child abuse. I don't, you know, that's a stretch, but it could happen. It absolutely Once can. we understand what's going on with people and why they do what they do, it could happen. And we need to have those audacious goals and dreams, I think, in order to get there. Robin, did you experience there a sentinel event that created movement around building this, or was it just more of an organic process developed over time? What was kind of the root cause for the building of this movement? Well, we call that, the piece for Tarpon, we call that one the nickel drops. When you get it, you understand, you have your first eyes open towards what trauma is and what that means. And for me, the nickel dropped. I was an elected official here in town. And because of that, I was able to serve on different boards and different agencies. So I was, for example, on the Homeless Leadership Board, was able to go to different programs, one with a a creative program with incarcerated women. And and I noticed that although there were so many different people and agencies and doing work to address these very, very complex, very huge issues that we face as a community, that the numbers seemed to be going up. The numbers of homelessness were rising, incidents of domestic violence did not, certainly were not decreasing, uh, sexual abuse of children, all of these things just seemed to be static or increasing. So it came to me, to my mind, that we must be missing something, that there must be something we were not really looking at or we would be having more effective results. And that's when I learned about trauma. And my eyes were opened to that. And from that day forward, that's the lens that I viewed the world through. And I think that's a common experience with people who get involved in this trauma-informed world is that once they understand that whether it's a thorny relationship within their family or a coworker or whatever, you're looking at a trauma history, that trauma is nearly universal. So chances are everyone you encounter will have some sort of a trauma history. And to have that understanding at the basis of interaction really creates a completely different process of working with people, living with people. And I think that this is the only way really to create a peaceful community is to understand the root causes Mm -hmm. of the issues that we're facing. So I've got one more question specifically for you, Marcia, which is, you know, Kansas City is not far from St. Louis. We're both in Missouri You've got assets and even some of the names that you're mentioning, like crisis intervention teams. We have that resource here in St. Louis as well. There's just a lot that we have learned from each other as cities and communities, and there's more work to be done in that area in terms of learning. So given that St. Louis has been ground zero for change, uh, given all that's happening here locally and happening nationally, what hope can you provide to our community, given the place that we're at right now, based on the work that you've done. Do you have any advice for us as we continue on this road of important work that we know um, could impact generations to come when we do this right? I think it starts with exactly what you're doing. It's having the conversation and having it in a way that we don't blame each other and that we really just sit down and talk about, so what's happening and can we understand, you know, what's going on behind the behavior? You know, what... I've learned so much over the last four years about historical trauma and what happens, you know, in our bodies, the epigenetics. And once we begin to really, really understand what's going on with us and inside of us, then finding the ways to heal. And some of them will seem pretty far out. So it's having conversations, but it's also, you know, if we focus on healing and we focus on you know, how to be better together, then I think there's hope. You know, the I know the events in St. Louis have been traumatic, horrible, you know, whatever word, but they also can be transformative because you can be so much better. We all can be better. We are learning in Kansas City from you guys, from what you've gone through. We're learning. We're having dialogue that we might not have had, but for you all. So, you know, share, learn 
talk. So those are some of my human thoughts. I want to thank you for sharing your human thoughts and your perspective, your wisdom, and kudos to Kansas City for so much great work that's happening there. I'm with you there. It's like, why reinvent the wheel? We have so many great things happening in this world. Yeah, we got to share that, too, because those are gifts that I think are for all humanity. So you said something that struck me that I wanted to make sure I had a better understanding of, and maybe our listeners do, too, which is trauma-informed community trauma-responsive community. Can you tie those two concepts together so that I can better understand maybe how they're connected and and how they're distinguished? Sure. Well, to me, a trauma-informed community is a community that understands the connections between behaviors and trauma, very basically, between challenges within a city or a neighborhood or a family and trauma, and becoming aware of how to properly react, respond, interact through that lens. A trauma-responsive community, to me, is the next step because, you know, we were thinking, well, so if everybody in our city is trauma-informed and they all know this, Mm -hmm. really, what's the difference? I mean, so everybody knows that. Well, that's great, but there has to be a next step after that, after people, after the awareness is raised and people understand and get it then we need to be able to creatively respond to that as our unique talents and gifts allow and and guide us, basically. So whether it's a a pastor of a church who's quite often a first responder for members of his congregation or her congregation, or a rabbi, whatever type of faith-based person that, that might be, or it could be a mom who might be a neighborhood spark plug, who might be the leader within a community, and to have services available to help people process trauma, to understand that beyond trauma, there's resilience, there's healing, there's hope, that human beings are tremendously resilient, that because someone might have a very, very high adverse experience score is not doom and gloom, that there are always, always chances for healing. And if we can do this as a community, the chances are much, much greater. So trauma-responsive community is to have our school, the different agencies and and the police department and fire rescue and city government to all being able to offer solutions to address trauma. Right, to be prepared to know what to do and not be reactive but proactive because the baseline understanding is common. That's Very well said. That's exactly right. So with that, before we close, is there anything else you want to share? Just know that the resources are there and there's a movement the whole trauma-informed community is that people are willing to reach out and help each other. We're finding answers in all kinds of funny places, and so just ask. We just need to ask each other. We need to learn from each other. And thank you so much for what you've done and the work you continue to do. I hope to meet you personally someplace soon in short order. It would be fun. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Robin, can you share with us the way that you frame success and give us an example of what success looks like in terms of this work? Well, in our work, there's a a saying that I love by a woman named Lila Watson, and it goes something uh, pretty close to this. She says, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you are here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think that, that that is a very pivotal point. Rather than assume what people need, we begin by asking people. So when we worked, for example, with one of our elementary schools, we asked the principal, what do you need at the school? You know, what would be helpful to you? What are your challenges? How can we help create better connections between families and schools? And some of the things that she needed were not necessarily trauma education for all the teachers and janitors and cafeteria workers and staff and so forth, but things like um, it's a uniform school. So some of the kids didn't have uniforms. And so they wouldn't come to school because they didn't have a uniform. So we supplied a very, very robust uniform bank for the school so that that would not be an issue for any parent. We provided tutors and mentors. City Hall, the mayor, actually encouraged all department heads to lead the effort to volunteer an hour a week to mentor and then lead by example to mentor these elementary school or, or middle school or high school students. So success is, I mean, The world seems to be very Mm data-driven, but if you're looking at something that's a very long-term initiative, that's a huge, huge effort, I think what we're going to see is better connectedness, a friendlier, more compassionate city, 
but also there will be hard evidence over time. There will be less domestic violence and, yes, less sexual abuse of children, and those, those numbers will be measurable over time. But the incremental mm-hmm. data is, is quality of life, for one thing, and that's very difficult to mention, happiness, quality of life, mm-hmm. those types of things. Anything in closing that you're thinking of in terms of offering advice to that person who's a little bit in a pause position to not know what to do next, that we need to help them figure out what is next, given their story and their history that includes trauma? I would say by understanding our individual challenges that we face, understanding our own trauma history, and really beginning to look at that helps. Understanding that we do have resilience also and hope built into us as well that also is very, very hopeful. You know, to me, it's like Peace for Tarpon, it sounds like a very light, you know, peace and love and all that, but peace is very profound work. The work of becoming a peaceful community is very profound. We all have seen what violence in communities, what violence in schools, violence in, you know, all the violent acts that we see. And in order to create a peaceful community, I think it's the work of our time. I think this trauma-informed work that's being done nationally is a public health issue. I think it's the largest public health issue that I will see in my lifetime. So I feel that everyone has a part to play in this and that everyone must play a part in this because this cannot be from the top down. It can't be mandated by the federal government or by the states or whatever. This has to be done in an individual, person-to-person, heart-to-heart, soul-to-soul, community-by-community. This is how this work will be done, to transform communities from the inside out. And I think that this is the only way to truly address violence in our society. It's not an easy fix, but I I see this as, as a true solution to what we're in the middle of, what we're in the midst of as a nation. I want to thank you for your reflection and for your time with us, for the things that we will learn together. I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of a relationship that gets well-established and becomes organic and grows because we need it. We need all the assets and resources that we can get. So thank you for joining this morning. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We are grateful for your gift of time to this conversation. We encourage you to stay involved and get involved. You are invited to join the conversation. If you, your family, or your organization is interested in talking about how we better the well-being of the region, sign up for more information, join the conversation, log on to AliveAndWellSTL.com, and let's build a plan on how we can work together and improve our overall health and become Alive and Well. The Regional Health Commission with Chief Executive Officer Robert Friend Jr. committed to providing a detailed review of change over the past decade in 14 leading health indicators for the city and county of St. Louis. The first decade review of health status report, an update to building a healthier St. Louis. Discover the narrative, the data, and celebrate the progress already made to improve health care access and reduce health disparities in our region. Learn more at stlrhc.org. Alive and Well STL is another positive production of Rare Gym Productions. Thanks for listening.